If you have an extreme dislike for sexual predators and child molesters and want some tips on how to protect your child or your grandkids, you'll want to hear these tips I'm going to share with you. First, when your child gets old enough and starts going to friends' houses, make sure that house that your child is visiting doesn't have an adult uncle that also lives at that house. You know the house. One of those houses where there is the parent or parent and their children, and then their uncle Chester also lives there. You'll want to ask yourself, why does this uncle Chester live there? Why is he not able to afford his own place? Or better yet, make sure you know the addresses and names of all people in any homes that your child will be visiting and cross-reference those names and addresses against the sex offender registry for your area. My point on that is, once a child molester is released from jail, they usually have to move, and they usually end up having to move in with relatives. It may be because their old place was too close to a playground or to a school, or maybe they lost their original place because they couldn't pay rent while they were in jail. And here's a common trick that serial child molesters will often use. The molester will befriend a family that has two or three kids, usually a single mother who is struggling to raise all three kids and also work. Obviously, this man won't tell the family up front that he's a molester. But what he's going to do is he'll start off with helping to pick up the kids from school and then driving them back and forth to basketball practice or volleyball practice, etc. And then once the family gets comfortable enough with him, then he'll start taking one kid at a time to some place where it's just the two of them. For instance, he may take little Susie to a park to work on learning how to ride a bicycle. Or he may take little Johnny to the woods for a hike. Or he may take little Timmy to a park to play catch. But while he's doing this, he's finding out which kids are assertive and which kid is more likely to do whatever he tells them. And then once he finds out which kid is more likely to do whatever he tells them to do, that will be the child that he molests. And all the while, he'll continue to have alone time with the other two kids, but he will not lay a finger on them. He'll be nothing but a stand-up guy with the other two children and will be the big brother that they didn't have. And the reason why the molester does this is, is so that if the one kid eventually comes forward and tells about the molestation, then the molester will obviously deny it and say the kid seems to like attention and that he thinks the kid is making the accusations because that kid is wanting the attention that he craves. And then the molester will go on to say what a great guy that he is and how he's just trying to help this family out and that he is alone with all of the children all of the time and that the cops can talk to the other two kids to confirm that he's been alone with them many times and has never touched them. And of course the cops will then go to the other two children and those kids will confirm that this guy has never touched them and has had plenty of opportunity to do so. And those other two children may very well believe that guy over their own sibling because he has never touched them while they were alone. Now I know that these aren't the only two ways to help keep your kids or your grandkids from being molested. But these are just two samples of how many kids do get molested. Two things that many parents don't think about while trying to protect their kids from predators. So this past week I went through a pretty intensive training class and it was to become certified to forensically interview children who have been a victim of molestation and abuse. Now interviewing children is different than interviewing adults. If a child tells his school teacher that his Uncle George touched him and then the school teacher notifies the cops, then when I go to interview this child, I just can't ask the child, hey, tell me where Uncle George touched you at. I have to ask the child open-ended questions. I have to let the child tell me that his Uncle George molested him without me asking any questions that may plant the thought of the molestation in the child's mind. And then once the child has disclosed that his Uncle George molested him, then I can give more pointed questions to try to find things out that would corroborate the kid's story about the molestation. Like if the kid says that Uncle George molested him, and the kid also says that Uncle George was wearing black underwear with red polka dots on them, then we would see if we could locate that underwear 
in Uncle George's bedroom. And if the kid says that Uncle George put some oily or greasy feeling stuff from an orange bottle on his bottom during the molestation, then we also try to locate an orange bottle of lube in the uncle's bedroom. But we would do all of that stuff to try to ensure that the kid was actually molested by his uncle instead of just running out and arresting him. Because as much as I like arresting child molesters, I also don't want to arrest an innocent person. But due to this week-long intensive training class, I have not been able to prepare an actual prepping video for all of you. I just didn't have the time to really invest in the making of a prepping video that would be worth your time watching. Instead, this video is just some quick thoughts that may help you protect your kids or your grandkids. And I was just able to use some B-roll of one of my many failed attempts to make off-grid pioneer style soap that us preppers will be able to make after SHTF. Now what I'd like to hear from you is, how much do you think that child molestation will increase after SHTF? Do you think it will increase much or lessen? And what do you think about the punishment of accused child molesters after SHTF? Do you think that groups and communities that have banded together will be executing accused molesters pretty quickly after the grid goes down? And if you belong to a prepper group, has your group given any thought about a process that may help to ensure that the allegations are true and that an innocent person doesn't get dragged into a field and executed? And have you considered using your area's sex offender registry to find out where sex offenders and rapists live now? Not only will this help you to know where to keep your kids away from during regular times, but also after SHTF. Now, I already know that some people are already typing on their keyboard saying that a person can be put on the sex offender registry because they got caught urinating in a public park or because they picked up a prostitute. And I have to warn you about believing that because this I do know, at least in my state, a person is only going to be put on the sex offender registry once they've been convicted of actual rape or child molestation. Basically, they're not going to be put on that registry because they were hiking and had to go urinate and then got caught with their pants undone by a park ranger. And I also know through experience with investigations that there's not a whole lot of rape or molestation cases that actually reach conviction when there's only an accusation and no proof to go along with it. I know that a lot of prosecutors or district attorneys are afraid to charge a suspected rapist or a suspected molester without some kind of corroborating evidence to back up that accusation. Like the example that I used earlier, if little Johnny said that his uncle put some weird oily feeling stuff from an orange bottle on his bottom prior to the molestation, then the prosecutor's office will be a lot more comfortable with filing the molest charges if an actual orange bottle of lube is found in the uncle's bedroom. So I really believe that 99% of the people that are on the sex offender registry are there because there was more than just an accusation. There was DNA evidence or other types of evidence that showed that the rape or the molestation actually occurred. Now I'm not saying that every single person on a registry is guilty of the sex crime that they were accused of. There's always exceptions to every rule out there. But I do think that the vast majority of them on the sex offender registries are there rightfully so. And I think your local sex offender registry could be a good resource for you to be able to plan just another type of caution to be used for when the grid goes down and the rule of law either disappears or drops significantly. So anyways, I should have a new video dealing with prepping next week. And until then, hey, thank you very much for watching, and I pray that you have a good night.